Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Yes, there are some people who are naturally incredibly charismatic and incredibly connected, incredibly intuitive. And those people will often do really well at sales for a short period of time, as you've noted. Um, and also be quite good instinctively if they've got the right heart at negotiation. However, that said, there are structures which improve everybody's likelihood of getting better results. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most listened to B2B sales show. If you haven't already, make sure to click subscribe and let's meet today's guest. Hello, my name's Gavin Pressman. I'm a sales trainer and sales leadership coach. I've written a couple of books on negotiation, which you'll find on Amazon, and I look forward to speaking to you. On this episode with Gavin, we're diving into a bunch of topics on the negotiation front that we've never really covered before. The gap, the separation between selling and negotiation, which must be the, the five-step process to working towards a negotiation where everyone wins, and not in a cheesy way, a way of essentially not haggling, not just giving away value for nothing, but negotiating and going back and forth with value so that everyone is happy, everyone wants to continue the relationship and everyone wants to move forward at the end of the day, which is what we're after, right? And with that, let's jump right in. Do negotiations have to be Donald Trump-esque? Do we have to go in there with firm handshakes, being trying to power play each other and trying to fight to the, the death and battle to the death to get just what we want out of them? Well, in a word, no. <laughs> um, but I probably you deserve a bit of a deeper answer than that. Interestingly, my most, my most um, happy moment after the release of my book was the week that we launched. Uh, I was third in the business charts. And I, I was one above Donald Trump's The Art of the Deal. <laughs> so it only happened for a week. It was a little bit before the presidential campaign. And uh, he is still, at the moment, he's outselling me. But the interesting thing is that, and I say this to people, if, it, if you happen to work for a business where you don't really need to have any repeat custom, where you don't need to have relationships with your customers, where you don't need to... Um, perhaps meet that person in another business context, then yeah, go in and negotiate like an arsehole. <laughs> go in and try and win. But if you work in a business, see, most of my the people I train and coach, primarily they're in media, they're in technology businesses. Um, and in those businesses, their customers are customers for life. And the people that are selling, the, the salespeople, the sales directors, it's not just that they're going to be doing business with this person in this role, but their next role and the next role, they're likely to take that book of contacts with them. And the interesting thing is, in the old days, people said, well, if you were selling used cars, perhaps you could do the kind of win-lose type negotiation. But the interesting thing is, you know, having spoken to some, some used car dealers recently, they tell me, no, absolutely not. There's no way I'd want to sell a car to someone and not give them as best a deal as I can because they're my customer in the future. And so when you start thinking about negotiation as actually an extension of a relationship, when you're negotiating with somebody, you are creating a deal. And the question is, do you want that deal really to work? And, and the interesting thing is that if you create deals that are win-lose, or even lose win. That's another interesting bit. But if you create deals that are win win lose or lose win, and therefore the power ends up unequal at the end of the negotiation, the fact is you're very unlikely to be motivated to do business with that person again. And that's the that's the that's the essence really of what um, I tend to train people when it comes to negotiation. So I want to get into whether there is a structure for this, which clearly I think there is here. Uh, versus people assume that they're good negotiators. And a lot of people get into sales because they have, quote unquote, the gift of the gab, right? They're good with people. And so they instinctively blag their way through the first two or three years worth of sales and business and then perhaps hit a wall or can't get over a certain point of revenue or whatever it is, can't, can't smash the targets as the targets go up and increase over time. So with that said, is negotiation something that is logical, is structured, there is starts, there are finishes, there are things that we need to collaborate on, or is it something that someone goes in there who is incredibly 
quick-witted and perhaps they're looking for that win-win and they're not looking for lose-lose or lose-win, which we'll, we'll, we'll touch on in a second. Um, but do we do we structure all of this or is this something that some people naturally just incredibly gifted and charismatic at? Well, a little bit like selling. Yes, there are some people who are naturally incredibly charismatic and incredibly connected, incredibly intuitive. And those people will often do really well at sales for a short period of time, as you've noted. Um, and also be quite good instinctively if they've got the right heart at negotiation. However, that said, there are structures which improve everybody's likelihood of getting better results. So the interesting thing is that the structure that we put in, in the book is seven stages. Actually, it's five stages. There are five stages of negotiation. We just, because we realize that actually when I do a workshop, when I work one-on-one -on -one with people, we tend to spend most of the time thinking about preparation because if you prepare really well for a negotiation, you get better results. So we broke the first three stages into the, the first stage, the preparation stage into three for the book. But what's interesting is the five stages I use for negotiation um, were originally developed by ACAS. And it, on the radio this morning, they were talking about a, a deal with the Hermes group. I don't know if you've heard it, on, on, yep. but that was ACAS. And what do ACAS do? They help organizations create better relationships with their employees that you know they and they negotiate and they developed in the 70s this five-stage process for negotiation and interestingly it works everywhere it works with hostage situations it works with international conflict those five stages you're probably going to ask me so i'll tell you they're prepare discuss propose bargain agree and if you so these earplugs are going all over the place um if, if you don't prepare, you're in trouble, clearly. But if you prepare and then jump into proposal, you're also in trouble. So you've got to think about preparing separately, discussing separately, and only then proposing. And that leads to good bargaining, good agreement. But the interesting thing is that it's not just the, the fact that there is a structure like that. There are plenty of tools that everybody can use to make sure they're better prepared, and that when they go into a discussion and when they go into the bargaining part of a negotiation, they're really well equipped to do the trading bit. When we, or, or, or when you outline this, Gavin, as something that was, or these, this particular structure was uh, put together in the 70s, if we go back further than that, if we go back you know, hundreds of years, perhaps even thousands of years, I don't know, I don't think the Egyptians are kind of documenting their negotiation tactics on, on the sides of pyramids, but is there something innately human about negotiating is this something that has been done forever and so very likely will stay very similar over the kind of next decade or seven that we're going to be working everyone myself and the audience included i mean absolutely i did did you read homo sapien no Sapiens. i've got it but i've not read it yet uh, so you know yeah he talks about part of the development of human civilization was our capacity to trade with each other and the ability to start you know money the invention of money was partly something that we needed to do in order to trade on a wider level. And as soon as we started having money and we were able to trade at a wider, with a wider group of people, we were able to, to effectively develop more civilizations. So that's not just about having chilies or having saffron, but it is partly about having chilies and saffron. And, and, and until we had money, until we had the capacity to do those, that kind of deal, um, we weren't able to, to develop ourselves. So... Yes, it's definitely innate. I mean, I, I, I love the quote from Chester Karras, which is negotiation is as old as the hills. When we're infants, we trade tears for attention. And it's so true. You know, when a baby cries, what are they actually saying? Well, it's simple. They're saying to you, if you pick me up, then I will shut up. And somehow they've been programmed with that incredible insight that parents don't like kids crying. Now, the truth is we know you could reprogram a child. You leave a child long enough, it will stop crying for attention. Um, but there is an innate programming in human beings to connect. There's an innate sense in humans that we want to try and help others um, and cooperate. Interestingly, you can program that out of people. And there are a lot of sales environments where because I mean, I don't know what the deep reason, probably because the sales director's an ass or um, 
the sales directors had, you know, abandonment problems or whatever it is. But they've created environments where it really looks like win lose is the best outcome. And look, okay, look if you're if you're if you're selling, uh, I don't know, if you're selling stocks that aren't worth anything to people who don't need them, then yeah, maybe you want to go for win lose. But I would say if that if any, anyone here feels anyone listening to this feels well i'm working in an environment where actually it doesn't matter uh my relationship with the person get out of that job mate. get out of it because the reality is it does matter it does matter what you do with your life of course it matters it matters whether you're creating value in the world so if you're if you think you're doing it just for yourself get out fight because actually every business needs salespeople. every business that actually produces value needs to expand its market so professional salespeople are absolutely critical to the economy of this country the economy of the world so don't get leave yourself stuck in a job there is there's no there's no point in um so getting passionate you can hear but yeah there's no point in wasting your resources selling shit to people when you can use the talent you've got to make a difference and it's your uh your only non-renewable resource, right? It's the only thing you can't get back, no matter kind of how you frame it up and whether you do it from a moral standpoint, ethical standpoint. If you're just flogging shite to random people that you don't care about, they don't really care about, and you're never going to deal with them again. Um, and then I feel like this all goes another level. We've touched on this in other shows. With LinkedIn, with like becoming hyper-connected over the next de decade or so, which people will not be able to avoid whether you are not on Facebook now, you'll be on some kind of business network uh, in the future because you'll have to, to to work in sales, right? When all that starts to come back around and people track, well, you screwed me over in 2018 or whatever it is, 2020, and you're trying to deal with that person when they're now a senior manager, they're a, a C-level director, whatever it is, and they don't have to remember your face, your name, or your organization, but your history of transactions is probably still in their inbox. And they say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll double check this person. It all, it's all going to come back around to bite us, right? So with that, Gavin, is the best way to start prepping for a negotiation to suss out what we want the end result to be? Or do we need to do preparation before we can do preparation to understand what the end result is, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, th I think I think we do need to do for I mean, there's there's a couple of stages. Now, I think there's there's working out what you want definitely. So so I, I you know we were looking for win win. We're not just looking for them to win. So we do need to work out as an organisation, as an individual, what do I need from this negotiation? The, the 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 steps that I use, you'll be aware of different ones, but I use top, middle, and bottom line, which is win. What do I want? What do I intend? What do I need? So it's like a top, middle, and a bottom line, and as soon as you start thinking like that, as soon as you start thinking, well, there's, there's there's different needs that I've got. There is something I really want. There's something that's in the middle, and there's a bottom line. There's a walk away point. And as they say at Harvard, they in the Harvard Business Project, they, they say if you don't have a best alternative to a negotiated agreement, what they call a bat line, if you don't have a way of walking away, if you don't have a thought of what you're going to do if you don't get a deal, then you're in trouble, really. So, so my suggestion is you, you've got to think about top, middle, and bottom line. You've got to think about well, what happens if I don't get a deal? What would I do instead? Because then you've got real strength. Um, but more importantly than that, you've got to think about the other person. And you've got to put yourself in the other person's shoes and think, well, what will they be thinking right now? And uh, and one of the exercises I've found really powerful, so I've, I've studied a lot of different things. One of the things I studied is NLP. And one of the most powerful exercises I've found was called deep trance identification. Have you ever come across deep trance identification? Nope. Enlighten us. So, so deep trance identification is, and I'm not suggesting you always do this, by the way, every time <laughs> you negotiate. But deep trance identification is where you take yourself or you're taken in by another hypnotist into a very deep trance. And you step into, you imagine the person in front of you and you step into their shoes and, and, and become that person. Hold on a second, Gavin. Are we going to continue this? And am I going to wake up dressed as a chicken or something in a second? <laughs> no, no, no. It's not going to happen that way. It's not going to happen. You could if you want to, but no, I'm unlikely to want to, to hypnotize you in the course of this. But, but yeah. So, so you, you, you can imagine. I mean, now the thing about deep trance identification is it's a process that Richard Bandler worked out, but actually it's what lots of people do naturally. So I often used to naturally say. 
wonder what my dad would do in this situation. Somebody I deeply respected. I, I, I would step into his kind of perspective and see it from his point of view. And lots of people have been doing this for years. Um, Mandela talked about doing it for, for some, from some of his mentors. So, so it's not an unusual thing to do. But in the context of negotiation, well, think about, and that's why I recommend people do, imagine yourself, you don't have to put yourself into a deep trance, but imagine you're the guy you're negotiating with or the girl you're negotiating with and you're in their shoes and this is the history they had and this is what they like and what they don't like and there's some other tools there. Well, from their perspective, what would they want? What would they intend? What would they need? And I remember, I mean, I was actually taught this model of, of preparing from the other person's um, perspective by an amazing woman called Sandra Proctor. And uh, she taught us this top, middle and bottom line. And she, I worked at Capital Radio at the time, so selling radio advertising. And then you, you had to think about the other person's top, middle and bottom line. And I remember just going back to the office and she just said, you know, get your notebook, write this stuff out. And I remember going back to the office and I had a big negotiation and I, and I did it. And I did our top, middle and bottom line based on what the company wanted, based on what we knew our walk away rates were. Then I did theirs, thinking about their history. And there was a, an interesting thing just immediately occurred to me. My God, there's very little middle ground. My God, if I was them, uh, bearing in mind what they're paying on other packages, bearing in mind what they've paid before, bearing in mind what they're trying to do with this campaign, oh, I would want some. So suddenly I had to go, instead of going into the negotiation blind with my top middle and bottom, I actually had to go back to my manager and say, wait a minute, think about it from their perspective. How are we going to make it so that we get this? And so to make it that we got our top middle and bottom line, we had to think about what extra value, what other things we could offer that were low cost to us, but high value to them that would make the deal more attractive. And interestingly, it was, it was quite easy. But it was that preparation, it was that thinking about what do they want to get out of it that made it possible. Do you share any of this when you go into a meeting? Because it seems like you go two ways. One, you go in, you align what you think are the um, kind of top, middle, bottom on both sides. Everyone agrees. And then you've got a real logical negotiation then, which hopefully is relatively seamless and, and it takes all the emotion out of the equation. The other side of it is, and maybe this is me, thinking back to the old school example of Donald Trump is if you do that, perhaps you've lost some of the leverage, especially if they're coming at it from another angle of they want to pound you into the ground. Right. Yeah. So, so look, it, it, if you're negotiating with a complete ass, then you're going to have to change the strategies that you use. Um, my suggestion, though, if you're negotiating with a complete ass, you want to stop him being an ass before you negotiate with him, because that's a, that's a challenge. It's always going to be a challenge. If someone's going in for a win-lose and you're going in for a win-win, it's not likely to be that effective. So in the sales process, you want to get somebody on your side. Um, see, I, I like to separate the idea of selling and negotiating. The sale ends when somebody says yes. When someone says yes, I'll, now the negotiation starts when they've said yes. What often happens, so I can remember, I'll give you an example. So I remember buying a motorbike. I was desperate. I was so excited about buying my my first ever brand new motorbike, and I was going to buy it in Park Lane, you know, where all, you know, there's a BMW yeah. dealership. And I always wanted to buy, I really wanted to buy a Porsche there, but, you know, it was a, it was a motorbike, and I was very excited. I was going to buy a new motorbike, and I went in there, and I had my book, and I, I recommend everybody, not exactly a book like this, but everybody should carry a book around with them at all times, particularly to plan negotiations. So, you know, you're writing stuff out, and you've got something in front of you, and it's clear. So I had my book with me. It wasn't as nice as that one. Had my book with me. I went into Park Lane, and I started speaking to the guy. And, uh, and I was, I because I've been in negotiation trade for a long time. I, I was playing a little bit with him. So I was saying, well, there's a couple of models I was thinking about, and BMW is one of them. So I was kind of doing that. I'm not really committed, and I had loads of information about where there were bikes because it was a brand new model when they were coming into the country. My dealer, who was outside of London, had given me a lot of this information. And the guy could kind of sense that something was going on. So he looked at me and he said, Mr. Pressman, Mr. Pressman, are you convinced this is the bike that you want to have on your drive this summer? And I said, well, no, not really, because there's, there's other options. And he said, well, Mr. Pressman, have you test drive the bike? And I said, well, no, but I've got one that's similar. I've read the reviews. He said, no. 
And he was like this, no. Um, I've got a fully loaded version downstairs. I'm not prepared to talk to you about this bike until you're convinced it's the one you want. So I'm going to get it up to front. You go and have a ride in, in, in Park Lane. Now, why was he doing that? Well, he didn't want to go into the negotiation until the sale had ended. He wanted to make sure that we... And one of the things I say about you only negotiate with equals. If you don't feel equal, it's not a negotiation. So the example I like to use is in the, the second and the first Iraq war. And I loved it. I loved So in the first Iraq war, we had circled Baghdad. And on the BBC News, said there was a negotiation this evening between the Iraqi generals and the Allied generals. And the Allied generals handed the list of demands and asked them to be signed. That's not a negotiation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not a negotiation because the two aren't equal. Sure. Now, a lot of times I experience this, especially just recently doing some coaching and, and someone started talking to me about a negotiation they had. And the person was not yet committed. So they were using price and package to try and gain commitment. Well, that's not negotiation. That's selling. If somebody's not committed, that's selling. When they say yes, then you can say, well, how are you going to get this thing? But do you want it? Yes. Yes, you want it. Well, now let's see whether you've got the right money and, you know, that can make this work for both of us. So let's let's just stop here for a second. And let's pull this into the B2B context of yeah. I'm interested at, at this this point and whether it, maybe it's on a slightly a bit of a sliding scale. Maybe you can you can show whether or it's a, it's a definite point and we change gears at that point. But in the B2B world, perhaps um, even to just get the conversation going to do the selling, we've we've agreed on a, a a budget or whatever it is. If we've agreed on the budget, what goes into the negotiation? What what could knacker the deal? In which case, we need to add a bit more value. And what value can? And I know the answer is you know could be anything. But what typically can a B two B sales profession professional add to the deal to to make the negotiation kind of smooth? If that makes sense. Well, the interesting thing is most people think when they're thinking of preparing for a negotiation, what can I add to the deal that will make it more attractive? Um, rather than also, what can I take away from the deal that will make it more relevant to the person? So so the first thing to think about is what can you take away? So what's in the package that they maybe don't really need that you can take away? But the other thing to think about is because what you what you're you realize is that actually you create value by exchanging variables, by exchanging things which are non-tangible. Because in most B2B situations, there's something that's fixed and constant. You are going to get a piece of software. The question is, how is that software going to be installed? When is it going to be installed? How many people are going to be there to do the installation? Who's going to do the support? How, how much support are they going to give us to that process? So the other thing is that it's worth thinking not just about what can I give, but what can I ask for in return to make the deal truly win-win. So lots of people will experience you, you sell a piece of software or you sell a piece of equipment, and then it's the implementation that makes it either profitable or not profitable for your business. Now, often when you say, well, will you be, will you be able to help us? They'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the question is in the deal. Well, how are they going to help you? How many people are going to be um, in the project team? At what time? At what time are you going to get the specs across? So if you can get the specs across this week, then I can give you. But if you can only get the specs across two weeks before, so thinking about the resources we've got in our business, the resources they've got in their business, what resources can most be exchanged to get real value? Does that make sense? This makes total sense. This is, is fantastic. So I've never really thought about it like this, Gavin. But does this come then before or after we get the, the the payment? Because most salespeople, myself included, we're all chasing that payment because well, me as what we're doing right now, it goes straight into my bank account. But as a B2B sales professional, I got commission when that payment was made, not when an invoice was sent. Literally, when that uh, I'm working with the NHS, it was a huge pain in the ass to get all that processed. But it, it obviously encouraged me to keep on top of the financial teams when we we're doing these deals. Uh, my background is medical device sales. So, does the negotiation or should the negotiation then happen? Of we've agreed on the price because now we're talking about all the, the terms of everything. I think most people would typically skip over that, try and get the deal quote unquote closed, as in get paid 
and then half asked do all the what we're discussing here the negotiation after the fact so should we shift that forward and does that i guess reduce our chances of getting paid because we're throwing up more variables into a mix than perhaps what were there before but on the flip side of that does it then perhaps increase the longevity of a potential relationship because everyone knows what's going on before the final commitment is made well, yes it's it's likely to increase the relationship and increase the likelihood of long term but the other the other the other thing that can often be put into a deal is next year's money and the year after's money so my suggestion is that, that the more you're thinking about all of the terms and conditions before you get a signature and before you take any money, then the more likely you are to create deals that make your sales the year after and your sales the year after that. Because that's, again, something that people often say, well, we could be doing this for three years. Well, my question is, well, is that something we can put into the deal then? And how does that look? Because this is something that with the podcast, I typically do quarterly deals with brands like Salesforce, HubSpot, LinkedIn, um, Microsoft, all these huge companies. Uh, this year, we're working with uh, Soapbox and we do, we've done a 12-month deal. But it didn't occur to me to say, and, and, and is this something that goes into contract or is this something that's said over an email of, if we do everything that we've said that we're going to do for you and you're excited, we'll do the same again next year for uh, you know similar price or whatever it is. How, how do we... How do we bring that into a conversation, if that makes sense? How 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 would I even just practically do that? Well, practic practically, I mean, if you're only dealing on email, you've always got a problem. But if you're if you're, if you're deal, you know, if you if you're dealing on email, my system would be to to send an email saying, "Can we pick the phone up?" Sure. Well, then, what I meant was but, got a commitment in yeah, writing yeah. on an email versus a. No, that, a but that's what I, what, I, what I mean is, you see, one of the things Sandra Perch taught me is that anything is negotiable. Um, um, and she used to say everything's to go. And we, she was this Scottish woman and she was an incredible woman. She said, everything's to go. So you can negotiate everywhere. And we'd be like, come on, Sandra. You know, you're not going to negotiate in a big department store. She's like, you can negotiate anywhere. Well, one day, um, it was the Howard sale. And one of the girls from Capital was in the Howard sale downstairs. And there was a massive queue. And there was a bit of a fuss at the front of the queue. And she got to the front of the queue. And what was there? Sandra Proctor with piles of dresses going, if you do this, then I will. And, and the, my point is that anything is negotiable. And what that means is that you can pick the phone up and or send a mail and say, look, got this deal that you're putting across for three months. Well, actually, I'd like to do it for six months. If you give us six months commitment, then I will do this extra for you. And you see, the interesting thing is, these guys that are writing you three month deals, they then got to come back and write the, the deal again three months later. So that's double their time. It might help them to do it for six months. The point is that in the discussion phase, so you think about well, what do I want? What do they want? And then the discussion phase, you start asking the question, well, would it be possible to do a longer term? So next time you speak to Sobot, so next time, would it be possible to do a, a three year deal? Mm -hmm. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, well, it might save you time and it might save them time. They might be able to lock in your commitment at this price. I, mean, I had an interesting one up when I when we went to um, when we went to to go to Audible to get the audio version of the book. Um, I was told by my agent, well, they, this this is what they're offering you. They're offering they were offering me I don't know, what were they offering me five hundred quid right for the Audible rights with no commission whatsoever. Right, so it's 500 quid, uh, um, and you don't get any commission ever. I was like, I don't want that. I don't want 500 <laughs> course, quid. Yeah. Right? I don't want 500 quid, and and I don't want to have no commission. Right? So that so my agents said, well, they're very, you know, it, it's audible and it's Amazon, and that you know they they just they they're the ones that make the demands. And I said, look, it's a negotiation book. If I can't negotiate, <laughs> I don't want to do a deal with them. You know, yeah. if they're, they're not going to talk about it, so. Send them a note and say um, he at least wants to talk about it. Is it OK to talk about it? And they said, well, you know, what's he got in mind? And I was, well, they, you know, what I asked what and it, it was interesting because this is a three way neg negotiation. I, I said, asked, well, what is really important? And one of the things they said, well, we don't know. We don't know what they said. It came back with like, we're not really sure how well it's going to sell. And there's an upfront cost for us to record the book. And then I sort of 
started thinking about it and thought, well, actually, so what would happen if you didn't give me any money? Would then you be comfortable about uh, giving me commission? And they were like, well, yeah, because they're, they're worried about you know the recording costs. Blah, blah, blah. And then, so I said, well, what about if you don't give me any money? What would you offer me then? And they came back with a much better deal for me. Now, I've no idea if it's really better for me, you know, whether I will make the 500 pounds or not. The point was for me was that print for, for a matter of principle. First, I wouldn't do a deal with someone who wouldn't negotiate with me. And secondly, I wanted to have some capacity to earn in the future from my work. And I wasn't prepared to give my work to Amazon for the rest of, you know, in perpetuity sort of thing. Now, so, so where I don't know, I'm not exactly sure where we started, but I suppose where we finish with this is if everything's negotiable, you've got to be prepared to ask people, well, what about a longer term deal? What about you, you, you using resources that you've got? And that's why there's a preparation stage. Then there's a discussion phase. Most people, even if they prepare, jump in with a proposal. So you have a preparation stage and then you sit down and you discuss and you use that magic word. The magic word's if. You, you constantly say, well, what if this happened? What if this happened? If we were to do this, would you be prepared to, you know, if, what about if this? And the more you can use that word if, the more you can get people thinking about conditionality, then that's when negotiations become magic. Are we just too soft? Or can we take some of the blame off our shoulders in that perhaps, you know, we're both based in the UK. It's not usual to go into a shop in the UK to negotiate. The price is usually the price, but elsewhere in the world, like when I spent time in Thailand when I was younger, everything is negotiable and they'll rip you off if you don't try and negotiate because they'll see you come in from a mile away. Is this that we've just been trained this way and so we find these questions, perhaps if we're new to this, difficult to ask when really they shouldn't be difficult to ask? Yeah, look, it, yes, you're, you're right. There's a certain amount of conditioning that you would have had about not talking about money. And, you know, I can remember going into a friend's house well, only a few years ago. Then his friend's house. I was like, this is a lovely house. How much was this? And then being told later that, that was a rude question to ask. Mm -hmm. right? And, um, and I thought, well, that's interesting. But, you know, we all talk about the value of our house. That's all we talk about. But anyway, it, I found it was rude. The point is, yeah, there's a lot of conditioning around money. The other thing, though, to, to, to point out is that there is a difference between negotiating and haggling. And when you're discussing what goes on in, in a market in Thailand, you're actually describing haggling. And, I, 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 and the, reason is, the reason it's important to distinguish the difference is because I can remember the first time I learned to haggle, I was eight years old or something. I was a little boy and I was in Israel, actually. And I was in Israel. I was on my family holiday and I learned backgammon from my uncle. My uncle was a lovely guy. He taught me to play back on this beautiful kind of in, inlaid board. And I, all I wanted to do was have one of those boards. So my my uncle had said, well, when you go to Jerusalem, there's a market there. You can buy them there. So all of that holiday, I was there for about three weeks. All I, I never bought anything. You know, when my, when we can't get, oh, I'll be like, no, I'm not having anything. I'm just saving my money to yeah. buy this back. Board. We get to the old market there. We get to the old, I get into the Jaffa Gates. I still know, I can see it in my mind. Now. It's so funny. And the first stall I saw was the stall he was talking about. You wouldn't believe it. There it was. The guys got the backgammon boards. And I'm like, I can't believe it. But I saw a religious experience. I'm in Jerusalem. <laughs> Look, what's happened? But, and there's this, there's this backgammon board and there's a guy. And I say to him, how much is it? And he says, it was liras in those days. It's 30 liras, let's say. And that's all the money I've got. So I grab the money, give it to him. My sister's like, what are you doing? So I'm buying the backgammon board. She says, no, you're not. I said, well, yeah, that's on. She said, well, how much? She said, it's 30 liras. And she looked at this old Palestinian guy and and he was like had been caught out. And so they started arguing about the price of this backgammon board. And suddenly he gave me back half the money and gave me the back. Word. And I was I was really confused. I didn't understand what was going on. Right now, of course, you know what was going on, but I didn't at the time. What was happening is they had haggled. Now, haggling is when. The price changes and the product remains exactly the same. Now, immediately as that happens, see, I couldn't trust anyone in that market, right? Because I didn't know that anyone was going to tell the truth. And that's the challenge is minute that you haggle. And, and this is why, why you've got to make the distinction. And in business, you must never haggle. 
So if you've said to somebody it's a hundred thousand pounds and they say they want to pay ninety five thousand pounds, you've got to make a reason for giving that five thousand pound discount. Because if you give it for ninety five thousand pounds, when you said it was worth a hundred thousand pounds, you might think in the moment, oh, I did it because you know, I'm a nice guy and he's a nice guy. That makes you a liar. That makes you somebody that's not trustworthy. And and a lot of people don't realize this, that they don't realize that's why they actually don't have incredible relationships with their customers, because they're lying to them. And their customers are always feeling a bit like, well, you know, I, 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 and they're effectively then the customer's got to ask next time for more of a discount. Yeah. Then the customer walks away going, well, I don't even know if it's worth 95. Maybe I should have got it for 92. So there's a sense of insecurity. But the reality is, well, look, we could start a discussion about payment terms and you could then say, well, could you pay all this quarter, which might be a real benefit for you to get your commission. So if you could pay all this quarter, then I could do 95. And he thinks, well, you know, I've not got a cash flow problem. So this is properly win win. And that's the difference. And so what tends to happen is people, A, don't like talking about money, but B, don't think creatively enough when someone asks for a discount and they think it's yes or no and it's never yes or no i love it that is a that is a i'm I'm going to interject here for a second because i've got just time gavin and someone else i wanted to wrap up the show with but that is a really good way of putting it and i have been caught out by that before i've been rollicked by sales managers for just going you know I'll, i'll give you a discount i'll do whatever it takes to close the deal i i think i'm you know doing them a favor by doing that but of course, you're not, you're, you're devaluing the product. And a way a sales manager put it to me after calling me a weak bastard, which obviously didn't go down well. And so I, I had that, you, you framed it much more sensibly in the minds of the audience in, in a more powerful, like empowering way versus you, you will you just weaken that deal, which is how I was told about this. But he framed it up um, kind of on another level of the price is the price because there's uh, kind of costs that you don't see of servicing, of research and development. There's all these other things that are going on behind the scenes that you as a salesperson, hopefully you understand some of the inner workings of your organization because it allows you to have a high level conversation, especially if you're dealing with someone who's particularly in finance, like a CFO or someone like that. But there's probably other things that are going on that unless you're the CEO of the company or even just you're, you've done multiple headed roles within the organization, you're never going to understand the price inside out. And so believing in the pricing is a powerful thing in its own its own right. Yeah, and understanding those variables, understanding what are the things that go into making it, uh, and then thinking about, well, look, if you want to pay 95000 well, what are the things that are either low value to us and high value to you that we can move around? Or what are the things that, for example, you might have that are high value to us, to, to, that are low cost to you? So you might have resources, Mr. Customer, that we could utilize in the installation that would make it actually as profitable for us to deliver for 95,000, for example. Yeah. And and for with Soapbox, I'm sure they won't mind me sharing this. One of the things they wanted wasn't just an ad in the show. They wanted to be able to share our content on Wistia.com and on the Soapbox page because it ties into then their audience. They're targeting B2B sales professionals and sales professionals in general. And so I could add value by essentially me uploading a bunch of videos which have already been made, produced. There's zero cost over my time of just uploading them. And they got a ton of value then, or they get a ton of value out of having essentially a a showcase of content that they're collaborating with and hopefully kind of the brands rub off on each other. So there's multiple layers to all of this. And there's one thing that I want to kind of wrap up with here, Gavin. This might be this might be you personally, as opposed to things that you've documented in the past, or this might be something that you've thought about and documented yourself. But it seems like there's some principles to negotiation. So what one thing you said earlier was to go never go for lose win, which is kind of what we're talking about here of uh, giving up concessions to get a deal done and, and ruining the potential of a longer term relationship. Another one was not going in and working with someone who won't negotiate with you, only doing deals with people who will negotiate in general. Um, if I've screwed either of those up, do elaborate. But other than that, are there any other principles of negotiation, like rules that we should kind of stand by that are kind of binary? Yeah. So, I mean, what are the other principles of negotiation? I think the key principle has got to be the more you care about the other person's long-term results, the more likely you are to get long-term results. 
that's not a spiritual law, although it might be a spiritual law. It's a practical law. It's a practical law that when people are getting long-term results because of having done good deals with you, then you'll get more business from them. So that's the first principle. Care more about the other person than you do about yourself. The second thing is don't care about how you're feeling. Your feelings aren't real. Right? Your feelings are the result of your thinking in the moment and they change in the moment as quickly as they come and as quickly as they go. So if you feel nervous, you feel upset, don't take it seriously. It's a trick that the mind has produced. It's biochemical. Um, and, you know, I think um, in one of my original negotiation programs, we had this phrase, don't let the buggers get you down. Yeah, if you're getting riled and upset in the negotiation, then and you're feeling it physiologically in your body, the likelihood is you're going to stop making clear, rational decisions. So get up, go and have a walk, calm yourself down, and bring yourself back to a place where you can think clearly. So don't let your feelings get in the way of making great deals. Love it. We're actually, and I probably shouldn't say this because it'll confuse the audience as to when this episode comes out, but I'm recording another episode later on today with, I think he's from out of Stanford University, on how to deal with your emotions and emotional intelligence and how to kind of manage it all. And they've done who, research on Who is it on that this. you're speaking to? Um, I'll tell you off uh, just in case that okay. show doesn't happen kind of thing. Because uh, <laughs> okay. I, I want to, I love interviewing these 100% academic science types, but they're the most unreliable people to get on a phone call with. Out of everyone I interview, they're always, a, uh, uh, not this person in particular, because hopefully it will happen, but they are they are a particular pain in the ass on occasion. Uh, so we'll, 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 I'll, I'll drop you an email. We'll touch on that another time. But uh, with that, Gavin, uh, I just wanted to kind of like sum it up that there is a lot of, Oh, there is seemingly data and research on this, right? It isn't just you and I putting our things up in the end going, well, if it, anecdotally, deals get done when there's less emotion in the room, when we're less fired up. There is some kind of research data on this, isn't there? Yeah, no, there's a really good book that I read last year by a guy called Adam Grant. Yep, I've had uh, Adam on. Yeah, so uh, give and take. So, yeah. you know, and he's demonstrated the, the power of this. Um, the, the, the reality is in Cialdini's principles of, of influence we know humans are reciprocal animals um, we're reciprocal animals therefore we react to what people do to us um, and we're not elephants and um, because we're not elephants we don't we do we do forget we're sorry we don't forget um, so you know because because we never forget it's really important that your relationships trump whatever you're trying to achieve this week or this month makes total sense well with that Gary, i've got one final question mates when i ask everyone that comes on the show and that is if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him that has nothing to do with negotiations but would help him become better at uh, better at selling when i was younger i thought selling was about having the gift of the gab it took me a long time to realize selling was about listening so i would tell my younger self to shut up and i'd also probably tell my younger self to not take this week and this month as seriously as so i'd get my younger self to be thinking a little bit more long term about everything really because when you're doing that you're still building better relationships you're building more that that's going to value you're going to get value from long term and is that one year is that 20 years where would be the sweet spot for someone who that just resonated with who's listening well i think it's all of the above but you know it's it's actually thinking well where do you want to end up right at the end of it all um and you know for me there's that very powerful exercise that i sometimes do with people in teams when we're working at a deep level which is what do you want people to be saying around your gravestone um and if you you know, if you're not comfortable that people are going to be talking about what you're doing now, stop doing it. Makes total sense. That was really, we'll wrap up with this, Gavin, but that was really emphasized for me. My, the audience will know this. My, my mom passed away a few years ago with cancer. She was a pharmacy technician. Um, so not, you know, a CEO or C-suite or, you know, she didn't particularly volunteer and, you know, she wasn't doing anything where she should be, you know, giving advice or working in crowds of people, yet... Her funeral was the biggest funeral that I've ever been to. I think there was over 600 people there, 
there was people queuing outside. It was mad. And she, she's, my mom was a crazy lady. Uh, I like to talk. She was, she would sit down and talk to anyone, but that was a real kick in the ass moment for me of a realization of what do I want? My it's, I don't know if this is morbid or exciting to think about, but it depends on your outlook on life, I guess. But what do I want my funeral to look like? What, who do I want there? Do I want my brothers, my friends, my family, everyone's super close. Do I want to have an impact? Do I want to have more of an impact than just the podcast? Do I want to impact the audience so much that they would want to come to a funeral to say goodbye to me? Or as in like, do you want to go wide? Do you want to go deep? And all these kind of weird thoughts came to my mind. I saw it as, as a positive thing. But that was a real uh, kick in the ass moment for me. And I never really pondered any of this before. And um, yeah, that, that was, it just kind of that came to mind as you said that then. Interesting. Interesting. Well, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. <laughs> well, we'll wrap Do up it. with that, Gavin. I want you to tell us about the book, because clearly we've, we've only scratched the surface of the book here, and where we can find out more about you as well. So look, you can see gavinpressman.com. You can find out about me and my business site is inspire-ing. So it's inspire-ing.co.uk or probably .com as well. Um, I've written two books, but I've got a warning for you. So I've written a book called Negotiation, How to Craft Agreements that Give Everyone More, um, which is a great summary of negotiation, which we've been talking about today. I've also written a book called How to Sell with Complete Confidence. But my publishers recently decided to republish the book have uh, negotiation and it's called creating winning agreements so don't buy two different negotiation books by me because they are the same book with different covers on it cool so if you get really inspired just buy two of them, buy, three of them. <laughs> buy, buy 30 <laughs> of them and pass them around to your team with that i'll link to everything that we've talked about including the books um some research and other things in the show notes of the episode over at salesman.org and with that gavin i want to thank you for joining us on the show thank you 